Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topics are environmental problems and test ban treaties. Let's get to it. Some of the problems that come with nuclear testing are straightforward. This figure, for example, plots the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere over time. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. It occurs naturally in small quantities, and it's probably best known as the isotope that is used to do radiocarbon dating. But it's also a byproduct of nuclear weapons detonations. And we can see here that at the beginning of this plot in 1957, the samples that are collected have very little carbon-14 in them. It starts to spike, there's a brief period where it plateaus, and then it spikes again, and then eventually we start seeing a slow drop-off in carbon-14. What we're going to be seeing ultimately in this lecture is that this figure very closely matches patterns in nuclear testing over time. There can also be more direct short-term victims of nuclear tests. This is the lucky dragon, and unfortunately, it had a very unlucky day on March 1st, 1954. The crew had set sail deep into the Pacific Ocean to catch fish. But what they didn't realize, and what the United States also didn't realize, is the havoc that was about to ensue. The United States was planning to test a nuclear weapon on Bikini Atoll that day. And as normal, they created an exclusion zone surrounding the region. The idea of an exclusion zone is to prevent anyone from being nearby and suffering the consequences of radioactive fallout. However, the United States failed to properly estimate the power of the Castle Bravo explosion. It was twice as strong as what had been predicted, and thus the exclusion zone was insufficient. In fact, if you look at the northwest point of Bikini Atoll, the blast was so strong that its crater is still distinctly visible today. The crew of the Lucky Dragon reported observing the sun rise that day, and then rise again, the second time being the flash from the nuclear weapon. They then witnessed what appeared to be snow falling all around them. Of course, it wasn't snow at all. Instead, the weapons test had destroyed a bunch of coral, and sent it up into the sky. Later, it would fall around the weapons test site. But worse than that, the coral was radioactive. And because it was falling on the crew and the boat, many began to suffer from radiation poisoning. One died directly, while others in the crew suffered from less severe health problems. Other environmental issues are not as obvious. For a strange one, Let's go to Scapa Flow, which is in the northern part of Scotland. This place is historically notable because the German fleet was sent there at the end of World War I, while final negotiations for a peace treaty were taking place. However, the admiral in charge of the fleet grew concerned that the victorious allies would seize the vessels and split them among themselves. And rather than let that happen, he preferred to sink them. And so the scuttling of the German fleet began, and the vast majority of these ships ended up falling to the bottom of the flow. Although this is interesting in its own right, the scuttling of the fleet became important for the topic at hand many decades later. As we've seen with carbon-14, testing done above ground sends radioactive elements into the atmosphere. This is important when it comes to the creation of steel. When you make steel, you are incorporating the air that is around you into the finalized product. That means if there are radioactive isotopes nearby, which there are because they've gone all over the place, you are incorporating those radioactive materials into the steel. Those radioactive contaminants aren't important for most of the products that you make out of steel. The radiation, after all, is coming from the air around you to breathe, so it's not like having that steel is going to poison you. Where it is very important, however, is with some sensitive devices. For example, Geiger counters. 
if you make a Geiger counter out of the contaminated steel, it's not going to function properly. This is where the scuttled fleet becomes important. Its ships were constructed with steel made well before any nuclear weapons were detonated. As a result, that type of steel is called low background steel, referring to the fact that the background air at the time of production had low amounts of radiation. In turn, the scuttled fleet has become a great source of low background steel, and as a result, some of it is fished out every now and then for the purposes of creating those sensitive devices. Kodak perhaps experienced the strangest of environmental externalities. Shortly after the first bombing of Japan, scientists at Kodak began noticing a fog in some of the film that they had. After doing some detective work, the scientists concluded that the only plausible way this could have happened is if the United States had conducted a nuclear test on its own soil. They, of course, were correct. The United States had conducted the Trinity test in July of 1945. This frustrated Kodak, because as long as tests continued on U.S. soil, which of course they would, Kodak's film would continue to be fogged, and as a result, they would not be able to sell the product the U.S. government would eventually agree to give Kodak an advanced warning of nuclear weapons tests conducted in the United States so that Kodak could secure raw products for their film that would not be affected by the radiation and thus would not have the fog problem. As an interesting aside, Kodak's laboratory, at the top of the picture here, actually had a research reactor that ran on highly enriched uranium all the way until 2012. Although not technically a secret, Kodak wasn't exactly open about it. And for good reason. Following 2001, the United States reoriented a lot of its nuclear programs to make sure that nuclear materials, especially highly enriched uranium, would not fall into the hands of people that should not have highly enriched uranium. Thus, while scientists knew about it, those in the surrounding community of Rochester, New York, including first responders, were unaware of it. In contrast, governments around the world were aware of the problems that came along with nuclear weapons tests. And so by the time the mid-1950s rolled around, there were discussions on what to do about the situation. The first step came in 1958, when the United States, the Soviet Union, and United Kingdom agreed to an ad hoc moratorium on the testing of nuclear weapons. Of course, there are some perverse incentives there. If you know that you're about to agree to a moratorium on nuclear weapons, you might start detonating a lot of nuclear weapons. And that's exactly what happened, with this one here being one of the U.S.'s final attempts. During that time, Khrushchev and Kennedy began exploring a more formalized version of the moratorium. This was not smooth sailing. Tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union began to rise, and during the process of negotiations, the Berlin Crisis of 1961 occurred. Both the United States and the Soviet Union ended the moratorium and began testing nuclear weapons once again. Making matters worse, the Cuban Missile Crisis began shortly thereafter. All of this led to an acceleration in the number of nuclear weapons tests being conducted. Correspondingly, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere skyrocketed after having briefly leveled off during the moratorium. The problem eventually got so bad that the parties came back to the bargaining table and reached an agreement. Here we see President John F. Kennedy signing what is known as the Partial Test Ban Treaty. As the name implies, the Partial Test Ban Treaty does not prohibit states from conducting nuclear weapons tests, but it does limit the types of nuclear weapons tests that they are allowed to conduct. These standard photos that you see of nuclear weapons tests with mushroom clouds are atmospheric tests, tests conducted in the open air. These types of tests are not allowed by the Partial Test Ban Treaty. 
The Partial Test Ban Treaty also prohibits nuclear weapons tests in space. I find the image on the right to be particularly frightening. It's a photo taken from Hawaii. And the thing in the sky is not the sun. That's actually a nuclear weapon being detonated. The final type of test that the treaty prohibits is underwater. The reason that each of these types is banned is because they impose particularly severe environmental externalities, whether it's in the air that we breathe or in the oceans that we swim in. Notably, the Partial Test Ban Treaty does not prohibit underground nuclear weapons tests. The idea here is that if you detonate a nuclear weapon underneath the surface of the Earth, you're not going to have nearly as much radiation spill over into the atmosphere. And as a result, lots of nuclear weapons tests were made after the Partial Test Ban Treaty had been signed, but those that were tended to be conducted underground. And you can see how it paid off, again by referencing this carbon-14 figure. The amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere peaks right before we have the Partial Test Ban Treaty. The long decline is not so much because of further nuclear weapons tests, but rather because carbon-14 does not have a very fast half-life, and as a result, it sustains itself in the atmosphere for quite a bit of time. Indeed, compliance with the Partial Test Ban Treaty appears to be near universal. Among countries that have actually signed the treaty, it appears that maybe the only violation of it occurred with the Vela incident. This, you will recall, is the flash that the Vela Hotel satellite observed in the Indian Ocean, which may have occurred as a result of a nuclear weapons test conducted by South Africa and Israel. The caveat to that statement is that I was referring to countries that have signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty. And here you can see membership is not universal. This is a treaty that has less participation than, say, the Non-Proliferation Treaty does. In particular, France and China are not signatories of the treaty. France simply wanted to keep conducting nuclear weapons tests at the time that the Partial Test Ban Treaty was created. And meanwhile, China was just short of acquiring a nuclear weapon at the time of signature, and of course wanted to keep its options open. And you will also notice that North Korea is not a party of the treaty. Much like how some countries view the Non-Proliferation Treaty as not going far enough, many countries also think that the Partial Test Ban Treaty is not good enough either. And what we really need is a comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. However, we're not there yet. According to the provisions of a hypothetical comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we have two different types of countries in the world, Annex I countries and Annex II countries. Annex II countries are defined as those that had research reactors on their soil at the time that the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was being negotiated. Here we see the blue countries are those that are Annex II countries that have ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. The countries in yellow are Annex II countries that have not ratified it. And by the provisions of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, it will not go into effect until every single one of these Annex II countries have ratified it. Every other country in the world is an Annex I country, and there is just about universal ratification there. But despite the fact that the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is not in force, it basically is followed. The most recent nuclear weapons test from the United States occurred in 1992. Russia has never tested a nuclear weapon, although that comes with the caveat that the Soviet Union had tested lots of nuclear weapons before Russia came into existence. The United Kingdom's final nuclear weapons test occurred in 1991. France's final nuclear weapons test occurred in 1996. And although France never signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty, it had begun moving its nuclear weapons tests underground well before that date. China's final nuclear weapons test was also in 1996. And again, like France, China had moved its nuclear weapons testing underground well before 1996 
despite the fact that it has not signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty. India's final nuclear weapons test happened in 1998, which of course is the same year that Pakistan stopped as well. North Korea is the only country that has recently tested a nuclear weapon, and I'm sure a good portion of my audience has only been alive for North Korean nuclear weapons tests. As of the filming of this lecture, North Korea's most recent nuclear weapons test occurred in 2017. And also notable here is that although North Korea is not a member of the Partial Test Ban Treaty, every single one of North Korea's nuclear weapons tests have occurred underground. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.